Who loves a makeover? I love a makeover. And I'm gonna go out on a limb here and guess that if you are joining me here, it's because you love a before and after as much as I do. And this kitchen here at House Heidi, which is the subject of my latest series, Sarah's Mountain Escape on HGTV Canada, is really a dramatic makeover. Why? Because this wasn't even the kitchen before. This used to be a kind of jumbled dining room, living room space. The kitchen was formerly located in the turret at the front of the house. And this house sleeps up to 16 people. So you know what it needed? A really big kitchen. And for me, renovating a kitchen is a puzzle. It's one of my favorite journeys favorite adventures and it's about how can you take a space and really make it sing. So I'm gonna take you through this super dramatic kitchen renovation here at House Heidi and tell you what I did. So first of all, I moved it here. What I really want you to think about when you are considering a renovation is before you invest the money in renovating, make sure that everything is located where it works best. And if it's not, this is your one opportunity to rethink it, to move it to the best possible location. I always envisioned that in this home, having the kitchen at the back of the house was the sweet spot. And it's kind of paid off. We opened up the entire space here on the second floor. And that is to create flow and it is to create sight lines and it is to make it truly function as an open concept home. One of the big things we did here at the back of the house was we added windows and doors. We have a friend who lives in BC and a long time ago he taught us what channel one was. And he said channel one is just looking out at nature. And Alex and I love channel one and I wanted this to be a channel one kitchen. So when you're in here now, there are two big windows that sit flanking the range across the back of the house. And it's so that anybody sitting here at the island can just look out and look through the trees. That's what channel one is all about. It's about having natural light. And so here at the back of the house, this kitchen is actually bookended by two bay windows. How amazing is that? It is almost all windows. So if you've got almost all windows, you know what you have? Almost no storage space. And every kitchen needs storage space. So here's how I worked that out. When I thought about how to divide the dining room and living room from the kitchen, we had some support posts and some plumbing that were necessities. Yeah, those are necessities. You gotta hold the house up and you have to allow a place for a plumbing stack to run down. So what we did was install two big flanking units of cabinetry that run floor to ceiling. And it gives us the division we needed between our living room, dining room area and our kitchen, but it also provides storage. And that storage comes in the form of some really fabulous kitchen cabinetry. And this is kitchen cabinetry that I've used for the first time here in this project. And it is from Kitch, that is K-I-T-C-H, like short for kitchen. And this is a really neat company because they started out creating door fronts and drawer fronts that work with IKEA kitchen components. But then they evolved so that you can either work that way, you can re-outfit your existing IKEA kitchen, or you can get the entire system from them. And that's what I did. And so what I've used here is these are super matte doors. So it's a slab door and I've combined two different colors. One, the dark one, which is on the island and also on the breakfast bar coffee station is called Gaslit Alley. And it's a smoky, dark charcoal gray, little hint of blue in there. It's not too blue. It's just a fabulous dark, dark tone if you're looking for a charcoal kitchen. And the other color is called Warm Alpaca. And it's just a fabulous, all round, easygoing neutral. Definitely has a gray tone to it as well, but sort of a warmer gray. And as you know, I am always a fan of mixing that warm and cool neutral together. Here's what I like about these doors, or I should say, here's what I love about these doors. If you're looking for a matte finish, you wanna make sure that you think about how durable that finish is. Sometimes you may have noticed when you go out shopping, you'll see a matte finish, but then you'll notice there's parts of it that are all shiny with fingerprints. So the oil on people's hands can transfer onto that finish. 
especially in a kitchen where you're thinking about the most used cabinets and drawers, you may notice kind of a filmy buildup. You don't want that. That does not look good. You want your mat to stay matte. So these door and drawer fronts are super durable. It's a super matte, non-marking. It's actually a self-healing laminate. So if it gets a little bit of a ding, it won't last. And when you're thinking about a rental house, because this is a rental house, you want those solutions that are scrubbable and hard wearing. So I decided I wanted a contemporary kitchen here. So I went with this slab profile. And then when you're using slab profile, what do you want to add to it? You want to add a really snazzy, fabulous, finishing touch and that is where hardware comes in. So I've used this simple bar hardware. You know, it's funny that I call it bar hardware because it's the exact same hardware that I installed in our bar back at home in the city in Toronto. Sometimes I like to find brand new ideas and sometimes I like to use something that I already know I love and I love this hardware. It comes from Lee Valley, you order it online. It comes in I think four different sizes. When using a drawer handle, one of the things I like is to install them all the same way. I'm not such a fan of vertical and horizontal install. Here, I installed everything horizontally. Tape it out with masking tape if you wanna be able to visualize it before you get your carpenters to drill through because once you've drilled, you've committed. I always say that my own projects are my experimenting zone, my place to use my own home as a lab. This is where I cook up fresh ideas and then I bake them and I see if they turn out to be a tasty concept. And that's what I did here. So one of the fun elements in this kitchen is I decided, do you see this ribbon of brushed brass running underneath the counters? Okay, there's two reasons for this. One, I wanted to add the extra detail. Two, I kind of needed to add the extra detail because the gables on my cabinetry are an inch and a half thick. I like continuity and I like symmetry. And in thinking about continuity, when you have an inch and a half thick gable, I think the countertop should also be an inch and a half thick. That's about the ratio of proportions and making sure everything feels balanced. However, I don't know if you've noticed, but lately we've had some supply chain issues. Getting materials has been a little bit challenging thanks to this pandemic. So when it came time to getting my countertop material, I wasn't able to get it in three quarter inch thick, but I was able to get it in just over an inch thick, but I wanted my overall countertops to be an inch and a half. So this brush brass detail is actually sort of a workaround. And I'd say one of the best workaround ideas I've ever had. So what I did was I used, have you ever seen a tile edge? Schluter makes tile edge. It's what your tiler would use if you had tile on a wall and then it was stopping. They install that tile on top of this edge detail. So you get a clean metal edge along the side. It also comes in plastic and it just creates this finishing detail. So one of my favorite things to do is reinterpret widely available building materials. This is the type of thing you can find at a big box store and it's about $20 for an eight foot length and there are a whole bunch of different finishes. So it doesn't have to be brush brass, but this is. Do you like this idea? I like this idea. I think it's subtle. I think it just adds this little glint of brush brass that is our accent metal material that goes throughout this kitchen. Where else do you see this? Look at these pendant lights. Here's another first time trying it idea. Often when you have an island, you install two pendants or three pendants, and they tend to drop down and be symmetrically placed along the length of the island. I don't know why, I just didn't feel like doing that here. I wanted to do something new and different. So I did a cluster of three pendants at one end of the island surrounding the seating area. So play around with it, have some fun. Maybe if you're thinking about this idea, again, experiment before you do the rough-in, before you have your electrician fix in place where these junction boxes are gonna be. You can hold a piece of string, you can use a balloon, you can have some visualizing techniques that will help you understand how your idea might look when it's done. A balloon hanging from the ceiling isn't gonna look as good as these lights do, but hopefully it'll help give you the general idea. Here's something fun about these lights. 
throughout this project, I wanted to harness natural materials. I wanted to bring the outdoors in because we are in this exquisite destination. We're here in Whistler, BC, and we are surrounded by mountains and rivers and streams and right now, lots of snow. And I thought that these pendant lights actually look like melting snowballs. When you're thinking about lighting, think about how you can use decorative lighting to add ambiance and atmosphere and some design drama. So at the end of the kitchen, I wanted a dedicated sort of baking prep coffee bar area because when I think about a house that's designed to be a gathering space, I think about having lots of cooks in a kitchen. Sometimes people say that there's too many cooks in the kitchen. I think when it comes to entertaining and gathering and spending time together, having lots of cooks in the kitchen is the best way to go. And I think that you should use entertaining and gathering as an opportunity to bring people together. So make it as stress free as possible. And that means have lots of zones and lots of destinations where different people can prep different things. Our baking area has a speed oven. So you can use this as an extra oven, especially good to consider if you've got a big house that will welcome a lot of people. It has a huge counter space, so I can imagine people rolling out pizza dough, making cookies, and it's also our little morning coffee zone. So if you wake up and you can barely keep your eyes open, think about creating that breakfast zone, that toast and coffee zone in its own area of the house, so people just gravitate right towards it. Whenever possible, I'm always gonna recommend having a second sink in the kitchen. It is handy for prep and cleanup, and it means that whatever prep is happening at that distinct zone can also get cleaned up over there, because everybody has to do their part. This house is kind of quirky and unusual. The back wall is not straight. The back wall is actually on an angle. And so how do you design a kitchen when you have an existing architectural feature that you cannot change? Well, you know what I think you do? You embrace it. So this island is not, not rectangular. It's, I don't even know how to describe what this shape is, but it follows the shape of the back wall. And what it does is it creates this big, wide section at the end. And I'm a big fan of having wraparound seating. Sometimes you have an island and all the seating is in a straight row. I kind of think it's fun to wrap it around a corner because this means if there's two people here and three people there, everybody can chat together. And so again, thinking about how you entertain. Sometimes I like to invite such a big group that everybody doesn't fit at the dining table. That's fine because you could have seated places here wrapping around the kitchen island and extra space also at the kitchen table. Because when it comes to all the functions in a kitchen, I like to combine perch seating on stools at the island, but I also like somewhere a little bit loungy. Because guess what? When it comes to me having my coffee first thing in the morning, I like to be comfortable. I like to wake up with a really big latte. And so that's why I installed a banquette here in the kitchen window. And it is one part lounging and it is one part dining. What you'll notice is we have a wall-to-wall -wall banquette. It's about 10 feet wide. And then we have a round table that is smaller. I could have maxed it out and put a big rectangular table here. However, the choice I made was to have a round table that sits off center so that you also have this just little lounging area because not everybody is taking part in the prep. Some people just like to be in the midst of the action in the kitchen and they wanna be able to hang out and lounge. So we have a leather covered banquette here and a collection of accent pillows in soft shades of green scattered across the back. Why am I waiting so long to talk to you about the main event here in the kitchen? The main event, the very first decision I made was I found this avocado cream range. This is so fun. This is a KitchenAid range. It's 48 inches wide, six gas burners, plus a griddle, two ovens. But more importantly, look at this color. As soon as I saw this range, I knew I had to have it. This is not the avocado I grew up with in the 70s. That avocado appliance color was kind of brown. This is like an overripe avocado. It is the most gorgeous green color. It is fresh, it's yummy. And for this kitchen, because we're nestled here in the forest at the back of the property, you're always looking out through the trees. And I wanted to harness that green inspiration. 
and I thought having a kitchen with green accents would be just the way to go. So then, how do you connect that one signature element? I always think if you're gonna have an accent, you have to repeat it. So if you have something that is unique and you want it to be an important part of the kitchen, I would say don't use it just once. You don't just throw in one accent. You need to have a repeated element. So I went on the hunt for the best marble backsplash that would complement and highlight our range. Your backsplash is sort of the jewelry of the kitchen, right? It is that feature, that focal point. It's what you see when you walk in. And in this case, with this kitchen, you actually see through the pass-through from the living dining room right in here to the kitchen. So this was a really important choice. This is actually panda marble. And often panda marble is black and white. That's why it would be called panda marble, right? In this case, it has these incredible green ribbons that look like rivers to me. And here in Whistler, there's Green Lake, which is the most exquisite color of soft green. And if you've been following my work for a long time, you know I'm a green fan. You know how much I love green, and especially soft green. This panda marble looks like Green Lake. It looks like my signature green. It's the same green as the range. And wow, is it ever gorgeous. When shopping for my backsplash stone, I found a slab that was big enough to be my backsplash, but also big enough to yield a gorgeous kitchen table. And here's something to think about. You can go online and buy just a table base, and then you can add your own top. So with one slab of marble, I got two amazing results out of it. I've got the backsplash above the range and also this gorgeous kitchen table. And so that connects the two elements together. Our counters throughout the kitchen have the greatest feel. They're sort of pebbled. It's almost as though they're leathered. These are Caesar stone counters in rugged concrete. And what's really fabulous about this material is Caesar stone is a man-made material. It is quartz and it's combined with resin and it is heat resistant, scratch resistant. You've heard me talk about it before. I am such a Caesar Stone fan. I've used it in so many projects. What's neat about the rugged concrete is it has this mottled surface. So there's sort of flecks of white, there's some movement in it, but it's not veining. It really does feel like concrete. And what I wanted to do was to create this super long island. It is over 14 feet long, and you can't get a slab that long. So I decided to highlight the construction details. I've referred to it before as honoring the honesty of construction. And sometimes you can't fool people, you can't hide it. So you know what I think you should do? Just embrace it. In order to get the 14 foot countertop I wanted for this island, I needed to put a seam in it. And so I thought, if I'm gonna put a seam, let's make a highlight. Let's accentuate it, let's call attention to it, let's reference the fact that we have this angled back wall, let's put an angled stripe, cut sharply with a bevel, and make it a different color. So it adds a little zing, a little racing stripe, a little zip. This material is called fresh concrete, and fresh, fresh con cloudburst concrete. I've used fresh concrete before too. I used fresh concrete Sarah Off The Grid season two, that fabulous kitchen that also had a fabulous backsplash. Let's take a look at that for a second. But this is called Cloudburst Concrete and this is a light, creamy, neutral tone. And this is the material that I used as the stair treads that run throughout the stairs here in the house. Fun use of material. Okay, back to what I'm talking about because I can get easily distracted. This super long island has a waterfall edge. So on one end we have the overhang and you can sit at stools around it and tuck right underneath. The other end has a waterfall edge. So this island is really embracing asymmetry and that's fun because you know what your kitchen should do? It should embrace fresh ideas and new ideas and it should allow you to cook and entertain and live the way you want to live. Oh, I have another space I have to tell you about quickly. While gourmet meals are being prepped in this kitchen, some people are gonna want to go to the bar. And right adjacent to the dining room, we have a dedicated bar area. This is a house for 16 people. There will be apres ski, and I always wanted the best apres ski in town to be right here in the house. So I designed a dedicated bar because it's fun. So here again, we used kitsch cabinetry and this is their slim shaker profile. 
in a color called Mist, and it's a fabulous light neutral. And the Slim Shaker profile, for years you've seen that shaker, kind of a wide shaker band on a recessed door panel. And now for the last few years, we've been seeing lots of this great Slim Shaker profile. This is not a painted door front. This has a laminate finish on it that is super durable. And the light tone of this complements the palette of our living room, dining room, open concept area. When you're thinking about designing a bar, think about how that elevation is going to look. This is only about nine feet wide. I like treating the millwork in a bar to look dramatic and beautiful, but I don't really want it to feel like a kitchen. So I like the idea of having these tall towers on the side. And then one of my favorite elements to use and think about and reinterpret is refrigerator cabinets. So refrigerator cabinets are those boxes that are usually kind of short and go above a refrigerator. But I don't usually use them that way. I usually like to reinterpret them. I've used them as uh, banquette benches. I've used them to create a long, low media console. I've used them for so many different things. If you use them in an overall wall elevation like I have here, the neat thing is you have flip up storage exactly at eye level where you want it, but also it affords you this display space between the top of the cabinets and the ceiling and you can illuminate it, which is what we've done here. We've got LED strip lights that illuminate up and down. And you know what they highlight? They highlight this amazing backsplash. Is this amazing or what? I saw this and I had to have it. Why? Because it feels like a mountain range. So incredible, so natural, so beautiful. But sometimes there's a challenge with that material you find. This piece was only so wide and it wasn't so wide enough. So here was my little workaround. I took strips of my stair material, which is also that material I used in the ribbon of the island, and I just did strips that run down the side. And what it looks like is, it looks like it's framing the marble. So always think about how can I make my end goal work? And here's the best thing. I am a fan of leftovers. Sometimes leftovers make the best meals. And I think that in design, leftovers can make the best solutions. Once I did the backsplash, there was a piece of stone left over. And I used that same piece of stone to create a floating desk at the top of the stairs. It is a little perch where you could sit down with your laptop, catch up on work, and it has just a simple wide edge on it. You can make a floating desk like this if you have a little nook. I'm gonna tell you how. You make a very simple two by four, put a ledger across the back, across the sides, a piece across the front, a couple of pieces in the middle, and then you drop a custom cut piece of stone. You do a mitered edge, a nice big wide band across the front, and voila, look at this. Fabulous floating desk. Good idea, great use of leftovers, Yes, it is. Last detail to tell you about here, lighting. Again, lighting matters. Repetition of lighting is a fabulous, effective way to create a design statement. Instead of one feature, you can repeat your lighting. So I got three of these flush mount fixtures, super fun, a brush brass disc with a frosted glass ball, and I repeated them one, two, three across the ceiling, because sometimes three is better than one. Okay, that's it. Kitchen and bar, lots of ideas, lots of solutions. Hopefully you found one idea out of everything I've done here that you might think about bringing home. Did you like this video? Well, make sure you hit the bell to subscribe for notifications so you never miss an episode because I got lots more, lots more to share. Thanks for watching.